Reproductive success is at the center of natural selection and it's therefore no surprise that evolutionary thinking plays a big role in how we look at reproduction as an aspect of evolutionary medicine. We're going to start by seeing the history of the mammalian reproductive tract. The eutherians, the mammals that have a long gestation period with a well-developed placenta, have a reproductive system that is an evolutionary innovation. In females, it's derived from ancestral organs that previously had produced eggs that exited through a cloaca. The innovations include the uterus, the endometrium, the placenta, and the vagina. These innovations are accomplished by changes in the developmental control of cells and tissues. And in this case, the genes that are used to control developmental fates in the reproductive tract had previously evolved to control the development of the body axis and the limbs. And so that's where we're going to start. Now the key issue in development is how to coordinate what many different cell types are, are becoming. If we go back in the history of biology, the fact that organisms are built out of cells is something we've known since 1839. That's the schwann schleiden cell hypothesis. These cells communicate with each other, they send and receive information on their spatial location, and they use that information to change their cell fates, that is, what they differentiate into. So virtually all cells in the eukaryotic body contain all the information necessary to produce the entire organism. The only reason we say virtually is that we have a few cells like the red blood cells that do not contain a nucleus. And therefore development is controlled by regulating gene expression, not by discarding genes in order to get different tissue types. Much of trait evolution has changed when and where genes are expressed and not the DNA sequences of structural genes. We're going to see a good example of that when we look at the mammalian reproductive tract. So what does development actually do in evolution? It shapes the variation in the genome that gets presented to selection. The developmental mechanisms that are shared among related organisms constrain the responses to selection in ways that are shared by relatives. That's why species resemble shared ancestors and basic body plans, and that is why ancestry influences responses to selection. To think about that, uh, a fruit fly has wings and six legs, and it will respond to selection on its ability to fly or to walk in quite a different way than a bird that has two wings and two legs. Now, genes build organisms out of materials that are interacting in complex systems. And those materials have to obey the laws of physics and chemistry. So genes have to work with the properties of those materials in constructing a phenotype. They can't directly control every detail of the phenotype. So we shouldn't ma imagine that mutations are able to change things in arbitrary ways. They can't. They are handed a set of systems and materials and they have to work with it. Evolution has shaped the properties of developmental systems by working with what they got from, its an from ancestors, okay? So they modify existing systems and that is done by working with whatever variants are available at the time. So not necessarily the best option, simply the best of those available. Thus, evolution doesn't design organisms a priori as would an engineer. It designs organisms in a process of sequential approximation. Now, the major players in gene regulation are sketched here in this figure. Transcription is going to begin here. And the DNA that will be coding for a protein is going to be laid down off here to the right. Just upstream of it, there's an enhancer sequence and a promoter sequence. And the gene is turned on or off by transcription factors uh, and enhancers that bind to these sequences. So 
these are being produced, uh, they're proteins, they're being produced by other genes that are regulating the expression of this gene. And you can see that depending upon what combination of transcription factors this particular gene gets, it will be turned on or off. Once it is turned on, the RNA polymerase starts walking down the DNA double helix, making messenger RNA. So gene expression is not only controlled by transcription factors, it's also controlled by acetylation, which, to, which will uh, unwind the DNA from the histones on, around which it is wrapped or bind it to those histones. So acetylation can uncover large, large stretches of DNA and methylation is a bit more specific. It can uh, bind just to one gene and prevent it from being expressed. And then there's also phosphorylation of histone tails that will activate or repress chromatin. So on a spatial scale, genes can be silenced or expressed either over large stretches, intermediate stretches, or just as single genes. A few general points. At the beginning of development, usually in the egg, a concentration gradient is giving positional information. So it will determine which is going to be the head and which is going to be the tail, which is going to be next to the body, which will be far away from the body, and which will be the back and which will be the stomach, anterior, posterior, and dorsal lateral, dorsal ventral. Transcription factors and histone regulation then define specific areas of the genome where a precise subset of genes is expressed. Gene expression, importantly, is often regulated by combinations of activators and repressors. This is important because it means that a limited number of activators and repressors can be put into different combinations to generate many, many more possible targets for activation or silencing. This combinatorial control then permits a huge diversity of cell-specific gene expressions. Genes that produce transcription factors are regulated by genes that produce transcription factors. So there is a hierarchy of transcriptional control. The same genes that play one role in the embryo can play another role in the adult, and this is one of the mechanisms that underlies pleiotropy. Genes that control the general pattern switch on first, and then genes controlling progressive layers of detail. One of the important sets, not the only one, but one of the important sets of developmental control genes are called the Hox or homeobox genes. They are deeply conserved. That means that uh, we can see, because they are shared by many different organisms, that they originated long ago, and they have, they have retained their function and their sequence on chromosomes. They have an interesting property of being collinear. What that means is that the sequence on the chromosome is analogous to the part of the body in which that gene is turned on or off to express a certain pattern. So the anterior genes are coming here on the left. The ones that are controlling the central part of the body are in the middle, and the ones that are controlling the development of the rear of the body are expressed here on the right. This is a phylogenetic tree, and it shows that the genes that are expressed in the anterior of Drosophila are also expressed in the anterior of worms and of mice and of sea urchins. So this is a very ancient set of genes. Here we can see an embryonic fruit fly and an embryonic mouse. And you can see that the Hox B1 gene, which is controlling the hindbrain of the mouse, is homologous to the lab gene, which is controlling the formation of the brain of the fly. And so forth, you can see going back through the body, the sequence of Hox genes in the mouse is in the same linear sequence as the genes in the, in the body of the fly. Now, duplicating this set of genes 
preserved their control function and it allowed new applications. So in the lineage which leads up to the vertebrates, the Hox gene complex was duplicated twice along with the whole genome. We actually have uh, had two duplication events of our genome. So we can see here both in the forelimb and the hind limb that Hox genes 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13 are controlling limb structure. And if 9 and 10 are on, basically it is saying make a humerus. If 10 and 11 are on, it's saying make a radius and an ulna. And if 11, 12, and 13 are on, it's saying make wrists and digits. And similarly in the hind limb. So the evolution took advantage of the existence of a developmental switch and a set of developmental rules for gene expression that originally had been set up to control the body axis, head, thorax, tail. And when the vertebrate limb came along and it was being developed out of precursors that were fins in fish, it simply took that and took a duplicate copy of it and used the same kind of set of rules to lay down a sequence in the limb that is like the sequence in the body axis. Now, let's take a look at the female reproductive system. We needed all of that history to set up this neat thing about the developmental control of the female reproductive system. In eutherians, it is radically different from monotremes and other amniotes. So the monotremes are the duck-billed platypuses and the spiny echidnas. Then we have the marsupials and we have the placentals. And as we go from the amphibians through birds and reptiles to monotremes to marsupials to placentas, you can see that we go from having a cloaca to having a vagina and then finally to having a well-developed uterus, uh, which is quite a distinct set of organs that look really considerably different from what we had in, say, something like a monotreme. So if we look at that in terms of timing and in history, the first thing that happened is that there was reduced reliance on yolk and there were some uterine secretions. Then the cloaca was divided so that there was a vagina and uh, a rectum so that those became separate, separate entrances or exits. Uh, the oviducts differentiated. Self, the shell formation to make eggs stopped. The uterus developed and began to nourish embryos and the placenta originated. That we share with marsupials. And then in the placentals, mammals like us, the eutherians, the the uterus and the placenta were elaborated, the embryo became invasive, and there was a longer period of internal development. When we look at the genes that control the eutherian female reproductive tract, we find some very familiar actors. Hox 9, 10, 11, and 13. So when a Hox A9 is switched on, the fallopian tombs are formed. When Hox A10 is switched on, the upper uterus is formed. A11 is the lower uterus, and A13 is determining the vagina. So these are now controlled by the Hox genes that are in the first set. And earlier in development, these are the same genes that laid down the body axis. So they also have some other functions, Hox A10 and 11 downregulate the immune system in the endometrium. That helps the uh, zygote to implant. And Hox A10 is also involved in endometrial maturation and in zygote attachment. A11 in endometrial maturation. And A13 in the umbilical arteries. So the point is that a pre-existing set of developmental switches was co-opted and used to help in the evolution of a novelty. It was expressed in a new, new place, and uh, this is all done through transcriptional factor control of gene expression. Now, interestingly, one of the innovations in developmental control 
was caused by the insertion of a transposon. We previously saw that the insertion of a transposon was a critical step in the evolution of the vertebrate immune system. It is what brought in the machinery that allows for somatic recombination. Here, this transposon inserted upstream from a target gene, bringing other genes under control of that transcription factor. And in this case, in endometrial stromal cells, the transcription of prolactin is controlled by an enhancer that's derived from a transposon, MER20, that invaded the mammalian genome when placentation evolved. So we're talking about something in the region of perhaps uh, 90 to 120 million years ago. That insertion then rewired a large genetic network. When we look at the expression patterns, we can see that there are about 1,500 genes that were recruited into endometrial expression in placental mammals. 13% of them are within about 200 kilobytes kilobases of MER20, this transposon, which binds the transcription factors that are essential for pregnancy and regulates gene expression in response to progesterone and to C-cyclic AMP. So this is one way that an innovation can occur in evolution. A transposon can come in and it is carrying with it a binding site for a transcription factor and if that will insert upstream from a series of other genes, some of which can be co coding for transcription factors, it results in the rewiring of a genetic network. So to summarize, the female reproductive tract develops under the control of the same genes that earlier had laid down the body axis. This is an evolutionary innovation. It required the rewiring of a large genetic network and some of the innovation was made possible by the insertion of a transposable element carrying receptors for transcription factors.